belief in the one true power. Belief in the one true power. Belief in the one true power. My solemn duty to protect America and its citizens. The United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. So Obama is talking about all of this with the global warming and that and a lot of it's a hoax. It's a hoax. I mean, it's a money-making industry, okay? It's a hoax. The president of the United States, a noted and consistent peddler of conspiracy theories about everything from millions of alleged illegal voters to President Obama's forged birth certificate and Ted Cruz's dad possibly being involved in the assassination of JFK, also believes the world's most dangerous and destructive conspiracy theory, the one that con climate change is made up. I guess by the Chinese. And that's been going on with the global warming for several years now. It's really expensive to do what a lot of the climatistas, as I call them, want us to do. Of uh, national attention, and in, in, in case we have forgotten, because we keep hearing that 2014 has been the warmest year on record, I asked the chair, you know what this is? It's a snowball. And that's just from outside here. So it's very, very cold out. Very unseasonal. So here, Mr. President, catch this. Mm -hmm. um. that this climate change agenda that Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton can want to continue to expand is is killing jobs in this country. Look, we we can develop all the resources of this country. We can end the war on coal and continue to develop clean coal technology. We have clean coal technology. We have the one of the most advanced coal burning plants in the United States. Of America. The lethal Santa Ana winds are returning to Southern California. Firefighters working round the clock trying to dampen down smoldering land that's threatening to reignite. Thousands of acres of land have been burnt to a cinder. Hundreds of homes and businesses destroyed. Whole communities wrecked 
in the most lethal wildfire storm since records began. It's only half of what climate models predict. Uh, the extra CO2 is on average good for life on Earth. Uh, so to me, this is much ado about nothing, that uh, there isn't really anything we can do about it anyway. The progress. It was progress. We have to care about the environment. It was progress. And it's like, no, like we've been losing. America has been losing. And Donald Trump understood that in, in a way that I didn't. And you I don't thought, think we have to care about the environment? Like, what no, do you no, not even a little bit. Like, no. Not even a little bit? <laughs> Barrier Reef along the coast of Australia is considered one of the greatest natural wonders of the world. It actually consists of more than 2,900 smaller reefs and 900 islands and countless species of fish, but its health and its future are very much in doubt. Miles O'Brien has the story for our weekly segment on the leading edge of science and technology. Half the size of Texas, spanning 1,400 miles, Australia's Great Barrier Reef is the largest living structure on the planet. It is rich in beauty and diversity, but it is dying as the ocean waters steadily warm. It's a very confronting situation, and I hope the people of the world take this as a call to action to do more about climate change. It's the second consecutive summer of extensive coral destruction, or bleaching, on the reef. Do you believe in global warming, climate change? Do you think the world's uh, going to change for the worse because it's getting warmer? I think that there'll be little change here. It'll go up, it'll get a little cooler, it'll get a little warmer like it always has for millions of years. It'll get cooler, it'll get warmer. It's called weather. I do believe in clean. And I've, I've received, a lot of people don't know this, I've received many environmental awards, many, many environmental awards for the work I do. And I believe strongly in clean water and clean air. But I don't believe that what they say, I think it's a big scam for a lot of people to make a lot of money. In the meantime... Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Can you say whether or not the president believes that human activity is contributing to the warming of the climate? Honestly, I haven't asked him. Okay. I can get back to you. Yes or no? Does the president believe that climate change is real and a threat to the United States? You, you know what's interesting about all the discussions we had through the last several weeks have been focused on one singular issue. Is Paris good or not for this country? That's the discussions I've had with the president. I'd like to go back to the first question that was asked that you didn't answer. Does the president believe uh, today that climate change is a hoax? You know, I did answer the question because I said the discussions the president and I have had over the last several weeks have been focused on one key issue. Is Paris good or bad for this country? Shouldn't you be able to tell the American people whether or not the president still believes that climate change is a hoax? Where does he sit? Defending his decision again <laughs> to pull us out of the climate deal in light of the Arctic temperatures. For example, I have a tweet of his. In the East, it could be the coldest New Year's Eve on record, the president tweets. Perhaps we could use a little bit of that good old global warming that our country, comma, but not other countries, comma, again, was going to pay trillions of dollars to protect against. Bundle up. Not good. So... Uh, the president tweets out, and they say, oh, my goodness, he's a, he doesn't like science, Marie Harf. Yes. Uh, he says global warming can't happen if we're freezing to death. Is he right? No, he's trolling liberals. That's what he's doing here. Look, climate change doesn't mean that it can't be cold. And depending on where you live, hot gets hotter, cold gets colder. Last year was the hottest year on record. The year before that was the second hottest year on record. He does not understand climate science, but right. his administration actually does. does Al Gore? The 13, the 13 science? scientists. Scientific agencies so in the Trump administration affirmed that global warming is real and that humans are the cause. Wait, global warming this year is going to end up being the hottest mm. year on record. What does that say about the state of our planet? There's some real problems facing the planet Earth. As you pointed out, um, this year could go down as one of the hottest years ever recorded in the history of science going back more than a century. This decade could go down as the hottest decade ever recorded. So there's some real problems facing the Earth, but this is a detour, a distraction from what we really have to face, like the heating up of the planet Earth. That's a real problem. Critical what he calls national security challenge, climate change. Listen to the president and Jeb Bush disagree. I know there are still some folks back in Washington who refuse to admit that climate change is real. The science is indisputable. The planet is getting warmer. I don't think the science is clear of what percentage is man-made and which, what percentage is natural. I just don't. There, 
it's convoluted. You don't believe in climate change. Well, I think the climate always changes, I guess is what I should say. Do I believe that this is like, you know, an issue that um, is being, that, that is fake, global warming, which they've changed conveniently. They got rid of the word once scientists started disproving it. Now they only say cli- climate change. Um, no, I, I think that that was just a way to extract dollars from Americans. I don't at all believe. They had no actionable plan. It was great for Trump to get out of that deal. It was terrible. Okay, but this is an incredibly complicated subject. Right. And if you would have to talk to a bunch of different scientists right. and see how they gather data and see what they understand about CO2 levels and what's the danger of them right. and what can combat it and what could not have this right okay. the fact that there is a disparity in the science community about whether or not it's real is enough to it's very little yep. very little disparity but most 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 scientists most the, the vast majority agree that human beings are negatively affecting climate change yeah the vast majority yeah i, I don't i just i just don't know people and by withdrawing today uh, from the paris uh, climate accord uh, the president has demonstrated his commitment not just to keep his word but to put American workers, American consumers, American energy, uh, and the American people first. This was a bad deal uh, from the moment it was signed by the last administration. Degrees is the target for limiting the global temperature increase, but if greenhouse gas emissions were halted now, temperatures would still rise by up to one degree Celsius. 6,000 years ago, temperatures were at this level, and America's Midwest was a desert. The world's food production centers will become barren again. In this future, mountains lose their glaciers and rivers vanish, the Indian subcontinent fighting for survival. A single degree temperature increase could eliminate fresh water from a third of the planet within 85 years. Warming at the poles happens faster than the global average. 40% of Arctic sea ice has disappeared in the last 30 years. While ice reflects heat, oceans absorb it. So as ice melts, the process becomes self-reinforcing. More ocean surface means more heat absorbed which raises temperatures, making the ice less likely to reform. Mountainous regions are at greater risk of landslides as the permafrost which held them together for thousands of years melts away. Low-lying countries like the Maldives are submerged as sea levels rise and countries already hit by hurricanes face ever greater storms. At a two degree rise, people begin to die in what are now considered normal summers. In 2003, with temperatures 2.3 degrees above average, 52,000 people died across Europe. Plant growth slows down, then stops. They don't absorb carbon dioxide as efficiently, instead emitting it. The extra carbon sees global warming spiral out of control. 125,000 years ago, when temperatures were 2 degrees higher, sea levels were up by 6 metres. Today, that extra water makes up our polar ice, which is melting. By the year 2100, sea levels could rise by a metre, displacing 10% of the world's population. In this two-degree future, 
ecosystems across the globe collapse as species migrate and fall out of sync. A third of all life on Earth faces extinction. Scientists say we can still avoid a two degree rise if we limit our carbon emissions to no more than 2.9 trillion tonnes. We've already used 1.9 trillion tonnes, we have one trillion left to use between now and forever. At the current rate, we'll use it in just 21 years. The big picture question of our study is to try to understand how large the impacts of future climate change might be on the entire global economy. So what we find is that global economic productivity peaks at about 13 degrees Celsius. So as you cool or as you warm uh, from that temperature, productivity falls off a little bit. We find that aggregated across the world, increases in temperature by end of century could reduce global economic output by more than 20% relative to a world without climate change. Most countries in the world, uh, we find, are likely to be harmed by increases in temperature. This includes countries like the US, and particularly countries in the tropics, countries that are already hot. So this has implications for how we understand future climate change. So. Preston Wells Griffith said the U.S. economy is booming due in part to lifting restrictions on the coal industry. We strongly believe that no country should have to sacrifice economic prosperity or energy security in pursuit of environmental sustainability. Various scientific reports, including a recent one by the U.S. government, have concluded that carbon emissions and other human activity have contributed to global warming. U.S. President Donald Trump has said he does not believe these reports and that efforts to reduce carbon emissions harm the U.S. economy. All too often at meetings like these, alarmism displaces pragmatic solutions to addressing energy and environmental concerns. In 1988, James Hansen gave uh, some groundbreaking testimony in front of Congress where he said for the first time that the signal of human-caused global warming 
is discernible outside of the variability of climate. Based on what we knew in 1988, uh, it, Jim Hansen was out on a limb. You could, have, you could have reached an alternative conclusion fairly. And in fact, if you look at the 1990 IPCC report, uh, their attribution statement was that um, the, the, the system was warming, it was consistent with global warming, but it was also consistent with natural variability. He was kind of out on, on, on one end of how you could read the data, but it turned out he was right. Our best estimates of natural climate variability can't come anywhere close to matching the size of the warming signal that we see, that we measure, that we've monitored. Uh, that seems like an important thing to state very clearly. Amazing. I mean, Hansen has been remarkably prescient um, uh, when it comes to the predictions he made decades ago and what's actually played out. Uh, he predicted essentially the warming uh, that we've seen three decades uh, ahead uh, of schedule. Well, Hansen got it right, basically, because now, by now there is no more doubt that we are observing uh, this signal of global warming. It has really very clearly emerged from the natural variability in the climate system and also the projections for the future that Hansen uh, published at that time, uh, they have turned out to be correct. And so Hansen looked at three different scenarios. Scenario A that had very rapid increases in, in greenhouse gases um, and very rapid warming, uh, a scenario B, uh, which had much, much more modest increases, uh, and a scenario C, which had essentially uh, no increases in the future. And so now we can actually compare what's happened to what Jim Hansen projected. And so of all the scenarios that Jim Hansen produced, his scenario B is closest to what's actually happened. And the warming that he predicted in that scenario uh, is an eerie uh, match to the warming that we've actually seen. Back in 1981, Hansen had produced uh, another paper where he had projected future temperatures, and those were quite close to what we've observed today, uh, in fact, slightly too low. Well, the actual temperature rise uh, since my first major paper in 1981 has actually been faster than what we calculated then. We did an exercise recently where we looked back at all the climate model projections that have been published since 1975. Um, so there's a paper in 1975, and 1981, and 1988, and 1990, 1995, etc., um, that all had climate model projections uh, for the next few decades. And we compared them to observations both before they were created and after they were created. And it turns out they all match up remarkably well with what's actually happened. Globally, we've seen warming of roughly 0.18 to 0.2 degrees Celsius per decade. Uh, so that's nearly three quarters of a degree Celsius over the satellite era, global scale warming. And that dwarfs our best estimates of natural climate variability on that multi-decadal time scale. Uh, he also uh, successfully predicted the cooling that we would see uh, once Mount Pinatubo uh, erupted back in 1991. He recognized, well, I can look at that. It's a test that their model did pretty well. Uh, so when given the actual aerosol from Pinatubo, from, as observed from space, when you put that into the Goddard climate model, uh, the model produced this rapid cooling. It, it pretty much got the maximum surface cooling that we had actually observed in the real world. And importantly, it got this long goodbye. It got the recovery of temperature to pre-eruption levels pretty, pretty well. And you got to get a lot of physics right in order to get that recovery time scale right. And yet, um, Hansen, using this fairly crude, decades-old model, um, made predictions that have, you know, borne out, that have stood the test of time. And it's reason to take very seriously uh, the predictions now that are being made with climate models that are actually far more sophisticated um, and detailed than the ones that Hansen used decades ago. We are now in a climate system where the uh, impact of, of his emission is, is, is so, so strong, so clear, that nobody in the scientific community uh, denies it. Um, uh, and when you get to that point in science, that's, that's, that's pretty strong. The real debate should really be about what are we going to do about this rather than uh, uh, talking about whether it's a climate change or not. Proponents of the global warming theory 
say that higher levels of greenhouse gases, especially CO2, are causing world temperatures to rise and that burning fossil fuels is the reason. But scientific evidence remains inconclusive as to whether human activities affect the global climate. There is simply no reason to take drastic action now. There's something really dysfunctional about the way the human family is organizing its economic relationships on this earth. It's clear we're in a long-term structural economic crisis at the end of the second industrial revolution. But now this industrial era has given rise to a much more profound crisis, an environmental crisis. We have spewed massive amounts of CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide into the atmosphere of this planet to create this industrial way of life. And now we have so much CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide in the atmosphere that it's blocking the sun's heat from getting off the earth. We are in real-time climate change. This is no longer a theory. This is no longer looming on the horizon. This is no longer imminent. Climate change is now at the house in the door. What's terrifying about climate change, and unfortunately it's never explained because if it were explained, 
our human family would be justifiably terrified and motivated and driven to begin to transform this planet. Climate change changes the water cycles of the Earth. That's what this is all about. It's never explained. We're the watery planet. Our satellite probes go to other planets, and what's the first thing we look for? Water. No water, not interested. Recently, they discovered what they think is dirty water on Mars, and everybody is thrilled. Our ecosystems on Earth have developed over millions of years based on the water cycles, the cloud cycles that traverse them across the Earth. For every one degree that the temperature of the planet goes up because of industrial-induced CO2 emissions, for every one degree that the temperature goes up on this planet, the atmosphere is actually sucking up 7% more precipitation from the ground. The heat is forcing the precipitation into the clouds, so we're getting more concentrated precipitation, more violent water events, but they're more infrequent, throwing the entire water cycle of the Earth off kilter. More blockbuster winter snows. Eight feet in Boston that last season? My gosh. More dramatic spring floods. That flood in the Carolinas, remember? They said this flood only will occur once every thousand years. It's the new normal. More prolonged summer droughts. My wife and I were in British Columbia and we're coming into Vancouver and the pilot says, we have some smoke coming in. And I turned to my wife and I said, he means smog. No, he meant smoke. Wildfires from British Columbia to California. Summer drought and wildfire. We have category three, four, and five hurricanes now, so dramatic that they're destroying infrastructure and killing people all over the world. That hurricane that hit the Philippines, this was the most powerful hurricane ever recorded, this is the new normal. What I'm saying here is that climate change is dramatically changing the water cycles. They're on an exponential curve. This is absolutely frightening. It's terrifying. And if you are a young millennial about to start a family, if you're a parent here or a grandparent, I want you to listen to this. Our scientists now tell us that we are in the sixth extinction event of life on Earth. It doesn't even make the headlines. This is the most dramatic story the human family has ever faced. There have been five mass extinction events on Earth in 450 million years. And each time, the chemistry of the planet shifts very quickly. There's what we call a turning point and massive die-out. And after the massive die-out of life, it takes upwards of 10 million years to get new life back on Earth. Our scientists now tell us we are in the sixth extinction event. This is not a model, we're chronicling it in real time. And what they're saying is that over the next seven decades, and many of you will be around for a lot of that, and your children will, in the next seven decades, we could lose over half the species of life that now inhabit this little oasis in the universe. As my wife says, we just are not grasping the enormity of this moment. We might acknowledge climate change, but we're going on as business as usual with a little greenwashing. 99.5% of all the species that have ever been on this planet have come and gone. Those are not good odds. And what's interesting is human beings, we're the, we're the actual youngest species, we're the babies. Anatomically modern humans have only been here about 200,000 years. There's no guarantee we're going to make this. And the new studies that have just come out, they're even more terrifying because they're seeing the freshwater melts in the Arctic now, in Greenland, and now in Antarctica much quicker than we expected, changing the ocean currents. And they're talking about storms that are beyond anything we can imagine that we've ever seen in human history by the end of this century. 
talking about the major coastal cities where much of our urban population is underwater. This is not a century from now. This is in the lifetime of many young people who are four and five now and will be my age when we're in full steam into this new era, this abyss. So what do we do? We need... market economy will be used here throughout. And since people are quick to kind of get lost semantically about what capitalism or a free market supposedly is or isn't, I'm going to define my context now, hopefully bypassing any semantic confusion. When I use the term market economy, I am simply referring to the core attributes shared by every major market system variation in the world today. And only three basic characteristics are needed here. The first is labor for income. Obviously, the whole global economy is based on employment. This is how people gain money to survive and spend back into the system, keeping it going. The second is that all resources, goods, and services retain property value transferred by means of monetary exchange. Obvious enough, everything is bought and sold through the use of money mediated by the market itself. And third, the overall incentive strategy is based upon competition for demand whether person to person or institution to institution, all oriented around the interest to A, save money on production, and B, maximize profits upon final sales. Again, this is the most basic gaming logic present in the market. That's it. Very simple. And again, these characteristics are universal to all economies functioning in the world today. So on to question one. Given the market economy requires consumption in order to maintain demand for human employment and further economic growth as needed, is there a structural incentive to reduce resource use, biodiversity loss, the global pollution footprint, and hence assist the ever-increasing need for improved ecological sustainability in the world today? The most basic mechanism of the market is the movement of money. And like the gas pedal on a car, if monetary circulation slows, it means demand and turnover slows, and the average effect is a loss of jobs, loss of income, and a loss of economic growth. Therefore, consumption is the fuel of the market system, and the more we consume, the better the health of the overall economy. Yet this necessity for constant cyclical consumption is in complete contradiction to what is needed for basic long-term species survival. Wouldn't it seem responsible to conclude that the goal of any viable economy is not only to meet the needs of the population, but to do so in the most strategic, efficient, and conservative manner possible. Yet the market incentivizes the exact opposite behavior due to this need for constant turnover. In fact, the entire basis of the market can be summarized in one paradox. The market justifies its existence by the recognition of scarcity, but due to its structural mechanics, actually promotes and rewards infinite consumption. The modern economy is no longer scarcity based on this level, it is consumption based, as it needs high levels of turnover to keep people employed and growth going. And obviously the side effect of all of this is ever accelerating resource depletion, biodiversity loss, and destabilizing pollution. Now there are of course countless corroborating studies that confirm how the world is increasing in its deficiency to meet the needs of the future population. Some estimates find that humanity will need 27 more Earths by 2050 to meet demand, for example. The rampant severe biodiversity loss is not only disrupting basic biosphere functions, it is now a fact that virtually all life support systems are in decline, with 50% of all wildlife having been destroyed in the past 40 years alone. As far as pollution, these issues are nothing but accelerating in both water and atmospheric, creating tremendous destabilization and ongoing environmental damage and negative public health outcomes. And keep Our economists are lamenting. They're asking, why has productivity been declining for 20 years? We have all these new killer products coming out of Silicon Valley. Why is productivity declining? I'm going to share with you a dirty little secret in economics that economists don't like to talk about. We used to believe that there are two factors that drive productivity in standard economic theory, better machines and better performing workers. But when Robert Solo won the Nobel Prize for economic growth theory in the mid-1980s, he actually let the little secret out. He said, we've got a problem here. 
When we trace every single year of the Industrial Revolution, these two factors, better machines, better workers, it only accounts for about 14% of the productivity. So Robert Solo asked the big question, where's the other 86% of productivity come from? Don't know. Moses Abramowitz, the former head of the American Economic Association, said, quote, this is a measure of our ignorance. Now, wouldn't you think economists would know where productivity comes from because that's the basis of the discipline? If you go down the line of what's possible, you remove the, the chaos of human society and its strange beliefs and everything else, and you actually look at what we can do, then there's no reason for anyone to be hungry, obviously. There could be an, an incredible state of efficiency and abundance across food and energy and production. So when we talk about abundance, it's so confused with people because they, you know, I, I get attacked all day long. Like, well, the world is finite. You know, we can't make an abundance. What's, you know, <laughs> and you, what, it, obviously, it's a relative notion. I mean, the, the sun will eventually burn out. It's abundant to us in the long term of time. So you, it's not about, you know, suddenly there's a magical amount of everything. It's about using the efficiency and, of course, focusing the economy on the interest to have an abundance because in our current society, it's the antithesis of what's rewarded. We reward scarcity. We want things to be generally scarce. This, the corporate construct does. Business doesn't want there to be an abundance of anything. So the pollution of the water supply, that's great for the water bottling companies. So we're rewarding the exact opposite. So you can't have sustainability, preservation, efficiency in a society that rewards the opposite. And therein lies the great con contradiction of the capitalist system. When classical economic theory was penned in the late 1700s, the vogue was Newton's physics. Newton was the big guy in town. Everybody wanted to use Newton's metaphor so they could be more scientific because he had discovered the laws that run the universe, supposedly. The economists also fell in line. For example, you know Newton's law, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction? Adam Smith borrowed that metaphor for his invisible hand of supply and demand. For every action on the supply side, there's an equal and opposite reaction on the demand side. Newton's law, a body in motion stays in motion unless disrupted. Baptist say borrowed that metaphor, the French economist. And he suggested that, well, supply will stimulate demand, which will generate supply, which will stimulate demand unless disrupted. All of our economic theory, if you go back and take a look at it, it's all based on Newton's metaphors in physics. There's only one problem with this. Newton's physics has absolutely nothing to do with economics. Nothing. Nothing. Newton's physics has absolutely nothing to do with economics. Nothing. Nothing. Economics is governed by the same laws that govern the universe, the solar system, the biosphere on Earth, and every single thing you and I do in our economic life while we're here on this planet. Here are the two laws that govern everything in the universe, including our economy. The first law of energy says, all the energy in the universe is constant. Since the Big Bang, no new energy has been created, no energy has been destroyed since the Big Bang. That's the conservation law. The second law of energy says that's true, that the energy isn't created or destroyed, but it always changes form, but only in one direction. From concentrated, the Big Bang, to dispersed through the galaxies. From hot to cooled off through the galaxies. From order to disorder, from available to unavailable. Entropy is a measure of the energy that's still there, but not available to do useful work. There are three systems that we can talk about in thermodynamics. An open system that exchanges matter and energy with the outside world. A closed system which exchanges energy with the outside world but doesn't exchange matter. And an isolated system which doesn't exchange matter or energy with the outside world. The Earth, in relation to the solar system and sun, is B. We get plenty of energy for the sun. We don't have to worry about this for billions of years. But in terms of the fixed matter on this planet, we don't have a lot of additional matter coming down here. We get a few meteorites, a little cosmic dust, but whatever we have in terms of fixed matter, which is a form of energy, has been here since we blew off the sun and cooled off. All of you have smartphones on you right now, and there are little granules of rare earths in those phones. They've been here since the Earth has been here. That's a form of energy, it's a material form. So, here's what economics is all about. 
We extract low entropy available energy in nature, a rare earth, a metallic ore, a fossil fuel. We extract it, and then through our value chains, we store it, we ship it, we produce goods and services from it, we consume it, we recycle it back to nature. Those are value chains. At every step of conversion, when we take nature's resources and move it through society, at every step of conversion, we have to embed energy into that good or service to get it to the next stage of what it becomes. But we lose some energy in the process of that conversion. This is called aggregate efficiency in economics. Aggregate efficiency is the ratio of the potential work versus the actual useful work you actually embed in the, in the good or service. Let me give you an example. Nature has the same economic conditions that we have in our human economy. If a lion chases down an antelope in the wild and kills it, about 10 to 20% of the total energy that's in that antelope gets embedded into the lion. The rest is heat loss in the conversion. That's the aggregate efficiency. We started the second industrial revolution in 1905 in the United States with 3% aggregate efficiency. Every conversion of nature's resources through the value chains, we lost about 97%. It didn't get into the product or service. By 1990, the U.S. got up to about 14% aggregate efficiency. That was our ceiling. Nothing's changed since then. Anybody want to guess which country led the world in aggregate efficiency? Japan, 20% aggregate efficiency, 1990s, reached its ceiling. You can have market reforms, labor reforms, monetary reforms. You can create incentives for killer new products. You can try to create a million Steve Jobs. It won't make a damn bit of difference. If your businesses are still plugged in to a second industrial revolution infrastructure, you can't get above the ceiling of 20% aggregate efficiency anywhere in the world. Why is this important? A new generation of economists who happen to study physics have gone back and looked at the industrial record and they added a third factor to productivity. Better machines, better workers, aggregate efficiency. The ratio of potential, yes, it's so obvious, the ratio of potential to useful work. When they put in that third factor, it accounts for much of the rest of productivity. Henry Ford could have told you this. In fact, every engineer could have told you this. Every architect could have told you this. Every biologist could have told you this. Every chemist could have told you this. They all have to start their training in school by learning these two laws of energy that govern the universe. And in terms of energy, I mean, what is possible right now? I remember reading that just such a small area in like Africa could power the entire continent plus part of Europe. I mean, there, I, I do an analysis in the book that just looks at it looks at all the basic renewables and each one of them has the capacity to create a global abundance and meet the current needs. And you put them all together in a synergy and then make, make basic what's called mixed use systems. It's a little bit technical, but we don't have any kind of systemic incorporation in our cities, not like they should be. Every single, everything in the house today should have solar panels that not only power the home as much as possible, but they run the energy back out into a central grid. Suddenly everything becomes an attribute of energy development, it's shared. And you do that if someone created a society that there's a few smaller cities in, cities, cities in Europe that are doing that with outrageous efficiency potential. So when you put all that together, uh, there's, it, it's absurd, it's absurd. You know, everyone in small pockets and these entrepreneurs are doing their best, you know, even uh, like Elon Musk and the battery technology, and they're trying to do something, but there's no concentrated focus. There needs to be a, basically a Manhattan Project to figure out what the best solution is globally to unify the synergies of all of our renewables and to make them all work. And if we did that, if we actually got the minds of, say, all the universities together right now, and you had a university project across the entire world and said, we're going to focus on this problem right now. What is the combination of renewables? How do we distribute it across the world? And how do we make it uh, create a, an abundance at zero cost effectively? And I guarantee if you did that, it would happen probably in six months. What is the silver bullet that can possibly transform this negative trajectory that we're on? And that is structural change of the economy. Morality is not going to do it. Our free will is not going to do it. Our rational sense is not going to do it in and of itself because we are so inhibited and dominated by the structural psychology generated from our social system. The ecological crisis, if it is allowed to materialize in the way the trajectories show between climate change, between uh, the water scarcity, between all the other levels of pollution that 
that are coming to fruition, the incredible amount of waste, you know, more plastic in the ocean by 2050, more plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050. Good God. Uh, the general destruction of the oceans, you know, overall because of various factors that are happening. Um, if this is allowed to materialize, and this is what I argue at the end of the book, it will just create that much more class antagonism and make it that much more difficult for us to pull out of, of this horrible uh, in-group, out-group phenomenon and the oppression that we see. So there's a time limit ticking down because if things start getting literally scarce, remember the first, first and second world war were dominance wars. They weren't based on scarcity. The kind of wars in the future, if scarcity hits like it, it's going to, if we don't change, is they're going to be cataclysmic. But the, the human society hasn't seen that yet, hasn't seen an actual resource war, not a real one. Not when water is now limited and people are going to go to war over it. And it's ridiculous to even think that that would happen frankly, because we have all the technology to resolve it. But the arrogance of the people that are in power and the, the myopic view of the business community is such that, again, they blinker these things out in favor of the general structure and they're willing to forego the well-being of others uh, in euphemistically uh, in order uh, to preserve their positions. So. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner, how frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Others nearby, the way.
Inside.